Um, and I mean, I, I know you're in the, uh, you've been in the healthcare uh, field. And I know you were talking about how other uh, facets of our uh, nation and everything else does have white supremacist origins. How does that cross over or how has that crossed over into healthcare? Um, it's horrible. I mean, I, I don't know how much we can get into about that in specifics because it is awful. I mean, uh, let's just start with one that I, I just can never get out of my mind that black women die at twice the rate of white women giving birth yeah. in Kentucky. Now it's like four times in Texas, but first off, women should not be dying giving birth. It's true. It shouldn't be happening. Um, so we have a, we have like a big, we have a big problem there. We have like a lot of sexism that has been baked in and that we do not, you know, I mean, we were like researching ovarian cancer on men until not that long ago and men don't have ovaries. So it, you know, just utter nonsense. Um, the way that we just did not include women, you know, in, into science and our research. So, and then you add in, the racism that's there and you end up with literally double the rate and it's, it's, it's devastating. Um, and that kind of carries through to lots of parts of healthcare. One that's really in Kentucky right now. That's so earlier CJ, when you were talking about with the tornadoes, the acute trauma right now, and people are willing to take water and diapers and food for the acute trauma, but that chronic trauma will continue. And there has to be that same level of energy for, for the chronic trauma to heal also. And the same sort of honesty around the need and how people are not yelling at each other right now because they understand the acute trauma. It's the same kind of way with like charity versus policy. People like charity. They like to give food and I mean, like to help people sleep somewhere tonight. They understand that, but then to donate to people who are lobbying to change the laws around our housing and around our food systems are, is way less sexy and way less interested, even though really mm -hmm. that would make a bigger change and prevent the need for that charity. So that like switching your systems thinking is true for the tornado right now. It's true for every day in our healthcare policies, you know, um, and it's especially true. The most, the most um, intense, I think, version of this, challenge of acute and chronic right now is with um, HIV and in Louisville, Kentucky. Really? Right. Uh, see, Dana, this is the thing. Nobody knows about it because it has been this such a long chronic issue that you know, we, we kind of forget about it, but we're actually in a, an acute pandemic right now. And we've got, there's a, I'm going to blank on his name right now. I'm going to try to look it up and figure it out. There is a black man who is a researcher at the University of Louisville who is doing a really great job of trying to answer the question, why? Why are black women getting HIV at eight times the rate of white women, even though black women use condoms at a much higher rate than white women? So black women are having way less unprotected sex and getting HIV at eight times the rate. So why? Right. why? Um, and there is, like I said, um, a professor at the University of Louisville who is also a black man who is trying to answer that question. But his, his concern when I met with him was that you can't answer it fast enough to stop the acute problem. We have, you know, we mm -hmm. have this, it's, it's really an acute problem in Louisville. Um, and it's the reason I my guess that the reason that it's not on the news is because it's a problem for black Kentuckians in Louisville, right? It's a problem for everybody, but, but the act with the really like the high numbers, the scary is coming out of, and it's in my, this is now, I don't, I'm not the scientist. I'm not a researcher. I do not know this. I am convinced that it is related to the over incarceration in our like carceral system. Um, mm. Yeah, well, because in my mind, it makes sense because we over incarcerate black men at such a crazy rate. Right. Um, right. You know, like it's, I mean, I, I'm a prison abolitionist. I believe burn it down, blow it up. I would like, if there was a way today, um, you know, if there was a way today that I could somehow make sure no one got hurt, but I could blow the walls off, I would do it and just take whatever penalty there was because I find it to be such a broken, unjust system. Um, I, don't, I don't understand why anyone wants to continue it. It doesn't work. Right. 
So let's. Well, it, it depends on who it works for. Okay. All <laughs> so, right. <sure>. So, <laughs> it's working for some people. And what we yeah. Okay, you're right. It, it does work if you're looking to maintain white supremacy and you're looking to keep people enslaved and have right. them making candles in Western Kentucky trapped in a factory. Yes, it works. Yeah. But if you respect the humanity of others right. and would like to have some modicum of justice, it is a complete nightmare failure. Right. right. I agree. And it works for those trying to make a profit. Yeah, we have to put that on the table. But if you want to make our community safer, it doesn't work. If your goal is safety in your community, if your goal is, you know, because we decide what crimes are anyway, but if you want no one to get hurt in your community, that doesn't help. Clearly, because people you know, still get hurt. <laughs> we, there would be absolutely no one getting hurt in our communities whatsoever, but there are because the way we lock people up only creates more trauma and only creates more isolation and only increases the risks, you know, of her, of it makes more hurt people and hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. Oh, yeah. So, like, it doesn't come from nowhere. And we are creating the trauma that creates the new trauma. It is our fault collectively. Most more white people's fault, but our fault collectively also. So, um, and I just like to make sure that I say things like that in lots of different rooms and lots of different meetings. <laughs> because that's something, Dana, that I think I can do. Mm -hmm. That's an action. Even though it's a conversation, it's still an action I can take when the meeting is not about incarceration. The meeting is not about, you know, how to be anti-racist today kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, but I can always bring it up. And, I, you know, oftentimes I put it in my little Zoom name. You know, I'll be like, really? Kara, prison yeah, I put Kara, prison abolitionist, because it's, <laughs> it's a conversation starter. That's and right. someone will send me a direct <laughs> chat about it. And yeah. I will say... I am an attorney. I don't know if I mentioned that, Dana, but I'm an attorney. Okay. And I do not believe that this system has any capacity for reform. It's not, it's, it's a failed experiment and we need yeah. to start over. Yeah. I love that. That's your act. That's activism for real. Yeah. yeah. You appreciate it. it. You appreciate it. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it is still a conversation, but I know that I get to some people in some meetings that w aren't going to hear that. They're not, they're not seeking out the same podcast I seek out. Nothing ever was handed. All of the respect, never about ego. Wish I could have retired a long time ago and disappeared way beyond the trees. But my homies kept influencing me. Said they needed to hear my lyrics, like my flow, cause they felt my spirit. Plus, the people needed to hear it. A conversation with conscientious lyrics.